Okay, let's get this rolling. Hi, everybody. I don't know who's here yet, but I am live. I'll wait just a couple minutes. I'm a minute late. So we'll probably go to 12.02-ish if you're already in the Bible study with me. Uh, we will get rolling here. I'm watching the seconds tick away. Once we hit 11.32, I will get a rolling. Um, let me pull up here one other thing just so that I can check in uh, from time to time. We send uh my wife a message and then we'll get going oh yes being um, at 12. i think i forgot to i did forget to tell her well it's fine i only just got myself in trouble it's fine It'll be okay. all righty um let us then begin we are in john 19 starting at verse 30. Um, i'm going to check in my messages every few seconds here. I did not bring my phone. Anyway, it's all sort of chaos today. Uh, therefore, when Jesus uh, took the wine, he said to Telestai, and bowing his head, he gave up uh, the spirit, or his spirit. Could go either way, probably the spirit. So to Telestai, it's all finished. Um, nothing left for Jesus to do. Uh, salvation accomplished. Um, now, uh, and then in the, in the, the saving of you is also the giving of the spirit to you. Uh, the spirit, um, Jesus's spirit is, uh, the one that draws you, uh, as the hymn puts it, draw me to your cross and passion. The spirit does that. Um, and just a moment here. I just want to let me just check something let me switch to this camera view so jesus's salvation for you is accomplished there's nothing left for you or i to do um jesus has done it all uh and this word uh finished here um if i'm remembering correctly the the, the high priest uh, used to say uh, kala, uh, that is, it's done uh, when it uh, when it comes to the sacrifices. So this is where Jesus echoes language of the the high priest. Uh, but yet there's another that's sort of outside the biblical witness. Um, but in the biblical witness, we're about to get something um, pretty exciting here. So let's keep going. Uh, therefore, the Jews, since it was the preparation day, so that um, the bodies would not remain on the cross uh, on the Sabbath day uh, for the that Sabbath for that was a great Sabbath day um, as Pilate so that he would uh, break the legs and they'd be taken away uh, therefore the soldiers came and Oh, uh, broke the first, the legs of the first one and the other one who was crucified with him. Okay, so the, we'll just pause there. Um, so they go to either side of Jesus. Um, and here, th there again, we, we have this idea of John is still there. Um, so on either side of Jesus, they go first. Um, it seems that they want to have Jesus suffer a long time, uh, longer than the other ones, even just a little bit more. Um, so they break their legs, but, uh, because then they'll suffocate because you can sort of crucify. That's how you die by crucifixion is that you suffocate. Um, you, uh, so they would lift up their leg. They could lift up on their legs in order to sort of catch a breath and then sort of sink back down. So you would linger for a long time, but when you break their legs, they could no longer do that. So you would sort of expedite the process um but jesus dies when he means to he's he's sort of god in that respect i give my life and he's able to determine no one takes it from me but i lay it down of my own of myself so they didn't actually take his life jesus gave it mm. 
So, but they came to Jesus, um, and they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers, his spear, like, thrust his spear um, uh, into the uh, the side. Uh and immediately blood and water came out. And the one who, was, who saw it is bearing witness. And his witness is true. Um, and we know that, and he knows that his witness is true. In order that you would believe. For all these things happened in order that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones is broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Um, so here Jesus, is his legs aren't broken, but his side is pierced and blood and water come out. And we could get into the biology of it, but who cares? It's not important. That's not why, you know, John does this. He writes this so you would believe. Believe what? Um, believe in Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you'd have life in his name. He's not trying to make you believe uh, an historical account, though it is an historical account. It's a faithful witness, but again, it's, it's not really the point. The point isn't that we understand the biology of it, that he was dead. I mean, he was dead. That proves it. But there's more going on here. Um... And so the, the prophecies here are fulfilled. So not one of his bones will be broken is a psalm. And then they will look on me whom they have pierced, which is Zechariah. Um, but if uh, this uses the Septuagint here in 37. And um, it's interesting that John, John does this. Um, we could get into the nerd realm of why John chooses to use the Septuagint in these places as opposed to the Hebrew, um, but I'm not going to do that. All I'll simply call our attention to is that if you were to go back and read the, the actual passage from the Hebrew, um, it actually says, they will look on me whom, they've, whom they have pierced. And so that's Yahweh speaking. Um and I think John, um, I think uses it to, well, it doesn't matter. But the idea here is that Jesus is God. And this is one of the reasons Jesus says, when I am lifted up, you will know that I am in John. It says, pastors from Zechariah, they'll look on me whom they've pierced. And then you'll know that I'm Yahweh because Yahweh is pierced. That's what he says. Um <clears throat> And blood and water come out. And there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Um, John sees in Revelation a river flowing from the throne of God. And this is the throne of God. Calvary is. Um, he is the king of the Jews at Calvary. And there, when I am exalted, uh, I will draw all men to myself. When I am glorified. So the Son of Man's glory in John, his kingdom, is, his throne is his cross. And so when John sees in Revelation the throne and the, the river of the water of life flowing from the throne, well, he's already seen that once. He saw that at Calvary where there is God himself, his throne, and the river of the water of life flows out of it. Whoa. Um, the blood and the water, which if we, we want to echo the language of, of Hebrews, is um, uh, that it will sprinkle our consciences clean with pure water. Um we are, no, we are, our bodies are washed with pure water and our hearts sprinkled clean by, by, by his blood. And so here, blood and water are tied together. 
John does this too. The Spirit, the water, and the blood bear witness. Aha, the Spirit leaving, uh, what leaves Jesus' body, as it were, at Calvary? Three things. He releases the Spirit, and then also blood and water flow out. These three things bear witness to who Jesus is and what he has done for you to save you. That that's salvation. That, the, that Jesus has re redeemed us by his blood. Um, blood and water. Save us. Uh, blood and water main themes in John's gospel also. Water in John 3 being born of water and the Spirit. Water and Spirit come together at the cross of Jesus. Um, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will resurrect him on the last day. John 6. And not only that, my words are spirit and life. And so here, the Spirit is there, and here blood. These things together. Let's keep rolling, so we can at least finish off 19 today. After these things, ooh, asked Pilate, uh, Joseph, uh, the one from Arimathea, asked Pilate. Uh, he was a, being a disciple of Jesus, but hidden on account of fear of the Jews, in order that he might take the body of Jesus. And Pilate uh, granted it. Therefore, he came and took his body. And Nicodemus also came, who came to him at uh, that first night, uh, and they were bearing uh, myrrh uh, as a mixture. Is it a mixture? Ah, a mixture of myrrh uh, and aloes, about a hundred liters. Um, therefore, they took the body of the G of Jesus and bound it uh, in linen cloths with the spices, just as the, is the custom for the Jews to bury someone. Um, and there was in that place where he was crucified a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which uh, no one had yet been buried. Uh, therefore, uh, because it was the preparation day of the Jews and uh, the tomb was close by, uh, they buried Jesus there. Yeah. Yes. There. Hmm. They emphasize there. I've never noticed that before. I'd have to think about that for a while. Um, in verse 42, they laid Jesus there. Um, but in the, in the original, it's, it's, there is at the start. I've never noticed that before. I'd have to ponder that some more. Um, so now we get to actually the, so I, I talked about at the start, um, to tell us die. The, um, the sort of the extra biblical witness that the, the high priest uh, was accustomed to say, um, Kala, it's finished. Uh, he would say so in um, oh, Aramaic or, or Hebrew, whichever they were speaking at the time. But in the biblical witness, um, now we're tied to something else. And it's why... Um, John has subtle hints back to Genesis. Sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle. I'll put it that way. So not so subtle reference to Genesis would be the way his, this book starts off. Um, in the beginning was the Word. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. In the beginning... In him was life, and his life was the light of men. So there's a definite echoing of, of, of um, Genesis 1 by John. Um, another example is how Jesus chooses to 
um, heal the blind man in John 9. Um, so Jesus makes mud and puts it on his eyes. And this harkens back to how mankind was formed in the beginning. Um, formed out of dust of the ground. But if you read Genesis 2, it talks in terms of a mist going up right before that. So it's, it's not just like dry, dry dust. It's, it's mud. It's clay. And so Jesus, as it were, as the creator of the universe, looks at a guy and he's like, oh, you're blind. Well, let me make a patch for you. Let me, let me give you some new eyes here. Let me, let me fashion some mud, put it on there, and that'll fix the problem. You just need a little bit more mud. It'll be all right. Um, and go wash it off with water. Um, and here we have the final reference to it uh, in the resurrection. One, Jesus is buried, you know, in the other gospels we're told it's, it's just a tomb that's close by. It's Joseph's tomb. You know, fine, whatever. But John wants to, to, to bring in this, this aspect of garden. Why does he do that? And here we have um, Eden restored in the death of Jesus, in the burial of Jesus. Because what's next is, um, well, Jesus is buried on Friday and he is in the tomb on Saturday. So then there's the eighth day, the eternal day, all that stuff. Maybe Pastor Borkhart will talk about that. I'm sure when we when you get to John 20. But this ties us even more to Genesis when we consider what are Jesus' final words in John. So here, um, Jesus says, it is finished. And then he bows his head and gives up the spirit. And then he's buried in his tomb on, um, on Saturday, on the Sabbath day, the high Sabbath day. Of course it's the high Sabbath day because it's the last Sabbath day. Actually, not just some um, Jewish calendar footnote, though it, it was that, but more than that, uh, because in Genesis 2, we are told... Um, well, let me pull it up quick. Well, that way you see it. Genesis 2. <clears throat> right here. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So here, you know, we always remember God rested on the seventh day. But here there's this special moment where it also, you know, it's sort of duplicated. Why, well, one, that's how Hebrew works, but two, God finished his work. And then Jesus finished his work. And then he rested on the seventh day. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. And then this Sabbath rest was in a garden because shortly after this in Genesis, he forms man, right? dust of the ground, mud, there's that. And then finally, the Lord God planted a garden. So here we have in John 19, Eden being restored. Creation being, uh, we'll do that and then I get back up here a little bit. Um, Eden is being restored. The creator has come to set creation right. And so it is that if this is Eden restored and um, the throne of God has the river coming out of it that John sees, so also then um, the little tidbit about Eden and a river flowed out of Eden and from it came forehead waters. So also here, Jesus, crucified, pierced, water flows out. Uh, water flows out into this garden. In all these ways, it, there's this connection in the scriptures. And it also echoes so many things, not just in Revelation, which would make sense. John wrote both books. Um, these themes come out in, in Revelation. There are also themes that are in 
um, uh, in Isaiah. And so that there is a river that flows in Isaiah into the mountain, up the mountain, a stream of people. Um, I forget what chapter that is right now. But a river of people flows up into the Lord's mountain, even as the river of the water of life flows down the mountain for the healing of the nations. Um, let's see here. Um, and here we see also the, the care for um, Jesus' body, um, that we care for uh, one another out of love. Uh, we care, for, as, as Christians, we care for um, our bodies um, until the resurrection of the dead. That's how long we, how long are we to care for for our neighbor's body, all the way up until um, the the resurrection. And when it comes to um, even how we talk about bodies, uh, they're still bodies. Um, here, Jesus's body is not called a corpse. It's never called a corpse. Well, it's called that twice. Uh -huh. um, uh, once in a in sort of a prophetic speaking by Jesus, uh, but when it comes to a historical account, it's the Gospel of Mark to let us know that Jesus really was dead. Um, but at only that one verse, uh, two verses, Jesus' body is always just a body. So it even affects how we talk about death. Death is a nap. It's not a corpse. It's it's just a body. It's resting. It's going to wake up. We care for it. We love it. And so um, whatever stage of life our Lord went through, we care for our neighbor. From um, conception up until the resurrection. And so that, that affects, as Christians, how we treat the bodies of our loved ones. And this isn't to say you can't, you know... I'm not trying to say that, that you have to be buried the same way Jesus was buried with spices and all that. The, I don't want to get into the oh the topic of you know cremation and all that, but even still, even if you are cremated, we, it still affects how we treat that individual. We don't just treat that body, even though they're cremains, you know, willy nilly, because the Lord's going to put that make that dust. Um, into uh, he's going to restore it he's going to put it all back together that's the sort of Lord he is the Lord who makes dust into mud and mud into bodies is the God who's going to look at our bones, our dust um, and restore us so that as Jesus is raised with his body so we too will be raised with ours and as Jesus, as Paul says, will never die again, so also we will never die again. There will be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, nor pain. The former things won't be remembered in the kingdom of God, as Revelation puts it. Eden will be restored. We will live as God intended us to live, never to die. He didn't want us to die. He didn't create us to die. He created us to live. And so we will live. We will live forever because Jesus died. And raised forever. I'm still pondering why, why it's uh, there then. On a, so that's what it says here in 42. There then, on account of the preparation day of the Jews... Because the tomb, near was the tomb, they buried the Jesus. There then. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. Seems the haste. Maybe it's just in haste. Just seems that they're rushed. That could be it. I don't know. And um, 
it seems <clears throat> here, um, well, I'll read verse one and then we'll get in. It'll give me something to talk about for the last few minutes here. Um, and on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early, uh, being while it was still dark, to the tomb and saw the stone uh, rolled away from the tomb. Um, so the names in the Gospels are important. It lets us know um, not just always like what characters are playing a role in a story, who, you know, who was there, what, what happened. Uh, but we also learn um, whose account we're being told. That's the other key. And so um, in John, uh, he only uses um, the account of Mary Magdalene at the tomb, even though he has reference to the other women. Um, because well, if, you, if you were to read to verse 2, so she ran then and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and says to them, they have taken away the Lord from the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. We. Um, so there, there's this idea of there's other women there. It's just John doesn't, isn't using their account. You look at the other gospels, you get their account of what takes place where it's like Mary Magdalene and Mary, the other Mary. And Mary, the mother of Joseph, who, whoever was there, it shifts in the resurrection accounts. In the same way, the burial account here includes Nicodemus, um, which seems to suggest that the John 3 account in a portion of um, the accusations against Jesus, and also here this burial, that John is using Nicodemus as a source. Or you get um, in Mark's gospel, uh, Jesus carrying his own cross, and they compel Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross. Um, and Mark mentions that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And you're like, well, that's weird. Matthew doesn't include that, neither does Luke. And there you get the idea that, um, at least to Mark's audience, um, these names are known. That's what's going on here. And so our testimony, so John claims this of, of eyewitness testimony, uh, but there's other sources too, but it's always someone who was there, who heard and saw. And what do they hear and see? Well, they saw, especially for John, a Jesus who was dead. John was there. He saw it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not there. Um, so much so that um, if you read the language, you know, uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus was crucified with a thief on his right and on his left. Um, but in John, it's translated, I believe, uh, Jesus, there was a thief on either side with Jesus in the middle. Uh, but the language of the Greek is one from the perspective of somebody who's there. But there was Jesus, and there and there was a, was a thief. John saw Jesus dead. He saw, his side, he saw his side pierced. He saw blood and water come out. He heard the words, it's finished. And then he saw the empty tomb. He ran and saw Jesus wasn't there. Um, and he knows from Nicodemus and, and Joseph of Arimathea that no, they, we buried him in that tomb. That one right there. They knew which tomb it was. And then as you work through John 20, you see John also saw Jesus alive again. And this same John also saw Jesus in a heavenly vision, reigning forever and ever. And that's our, our comfort here, is that it's not just trying to give us historical accounts so that we would believe that this Jesus is who he says he is, that he's God, that he saves us, that he has done 
absolutely everything to save us. He rested for us. He rose for us. And because of that, we're going to be we're saved. And so we believe in him because of what he's done for us and for all. Anyway, I hope that all was helpful and, a, and beneficial to you. And I, I pray the Lord Jesus would, would bless you today with his baptismal mercy and favor. And then I hope uh, you enjoy coming back on Monday with Pastor Borkhart.